This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blayton. And we did not plan that, but it worked anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show this week. We do not have a guest live on the show right now. However, for your viewing slash listening pleasure, we do have a pre-taped interview that I did earlier this week with Mark Ostro. Mark is the founder and CEO of Score Street, which is a service that we talked about Oh, probably three or four weeks ago when it, it first launched. Um, and they're an independent publisher. Uh, they they are a uh, an independent publisher, but they are also kind of a platform uh, that will allow composers to put their works uh, on the web and make them available for sale in digital format and in print-on-demand formats. Uh, and they also handle lots of other things for you. So uh, I won't take any more of Mark's thunder. Here is my interview with Mark. All right, and I'm here with Mark Ostro of Score Street. Mark, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us this morning. Well, thank you for having this me. This evening as we're recording it. <laughs> it's, a, it it's a pleasure. Well, uh, first of all, for, for anyone that uh, isn't familiar with Score Street, um, you are a new kind of music publisher. Um, and maybe you could just start out explaining what your experience was with the music publishing industry that caused you to want to strike out on your own in this way? Well, i ha happy to. And, you know, I frequently relay a couple of anecdotes. I don't know, Dave, what you know about my background. Um, at one time, I ran the New York office of Boozy and Hawks. And before okay. then, I was... Um, with uh, BMI as a, an attorney in the legal department, and before that I was with a small boutique publisher that specialized in jazz, and before then, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was in private practice as an attorney with various firms. So anyway, uh, my experience with publishing is that basically you have a situation where for the composers who write new music, and I define new music very broadly to encompass jazz and, and other music that is primarily scored and primarily for, you know, written out for ensembles. You know, that's not to say that, you know, a, a, a piece for, for rock band can't be new music, but I, I think we kind of know the music that we're talking about. And the, mu and the publishers that traditionally have represented new music uh, we can name them on you know less than less than ten fingers. You know you got Boozy, you got Shermer, you got uh, Carl Fisher and Presser, which of course have merged. Uh, you got uh, Shot EAM. You've got um, Peer, Peters, Subido, uh, and maybe one or two others. And part of the reason for Score Street came from a discussion that I had with uh, an esteemed group of people at uh, the ASCAP Expo last year, and the, uh, the group was myself, my partner Steve Culbertson, who as you may know is the uh, president of Subido Music, which is a partner in Score Street, and uh, Jim Kendrick, who is on the ASCAP board and who um, is an, uh, the acting president of EAM and also uh, is on various uh, composer boards like the Copeland Fund and things like that. Doug Wood, who's on the ASCAP board, trained as a composer. He runs uh, a production uh, library service. And the last person in the group was Corey Field, who has a DMA in composition and went to law school and is now uh, uh, a uh, past president of the Copyright Society and represents a lot of people in the entertainment business, including uh, composers. And I pose the following question. If you take all the publishers that I just named about a minute ago, combine them. How many composers, Dave, do you think that that combined group signs in the United States in a year? All of those publishers together? Combined, yep. Fifteen? You're in the ballpark, but it's even lower than that. Really? It's less than, it's less than ten. Wow. If you take the European imprints and add those to the mix uh, and include, you know, the, you know, publisher you know a publisher like boozy or shot that signs composers in europe 
you may get maybe two dozen, maybe three dozen tops. So, and is that because now is that because they are like being like stingy and protective or do they on, are they only able to um you know justify signing and the 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 expenses for a very small number of composers that they think can have a very high number of sales it's more of the latter than the former okay and if you think about it you know the the, the traditional publishing model and, uh, you know, here, here's a, another slight plug other than for Score Street. I don't know if you are a member of uh, ACF, but right, but right now on their site, uh, on the public site, is a short blog piece that I wrote, you know, everything you need to know about music publishing in under 2,000 words. And as an ACF member, even after that disappears from the public site, you'll still be able to access it from the members-only section of the website. And, you know, part of what I explained is, you know, the traditional publishing model, of course, is you're a composer. Okay, big stretch there. I'm a music publisher, another leap of faith. And you and I enter into a contract, and you assign your copyright to me for the life of the copyright. And in exchange, we essentially split the royalties 50-50. Now, what my 50% as publisher entails is I have, you know a uh, physical building uh, that I have to pay rent for, and I've got staff that i got to pay, and equipment, and it costs a lot of money to create performance materials. For example, if you take um, a full-length, uh, you know, a symphony, a uh, new music symphony, they're typically, as you know, somewhere between 18 and maybe 25 minutes. That's even with a composer delivering Sibelius or Finale files to, to really clean that up to make it house style uh, at a Boozy or a Shermer, you know, that's tens of thousands of dollars. And, you know, it's well in excess of $50,000 for that kind of editorial work for a full-length opera. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. You have a promotion staff that's there to promote the catalog and to promote individual composers and to be an individual composer's representative. And hopefully at the end of the day, after all of those expenses, there's a little bit of profit. So that's the traditional model. And under that model, because you are delivering or supposed to be delivering a hands-on service, you can only handle so many people because if you take a shop like Boozy, you know, which I know because I used to work there, okay, you have your, 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 your frontline composers like um, John Adams and Steve Reich and, and, and Ned Roram and Chris Rouse. But you also have the legacy catalog that still has to be worked and maintained. And uh, the heirs tend to be more vocal than the living composers. So, you know, you got to tend to the Stravinsky's and the Bartok's and the Rachmaninoff's and all that. So it's for those reasons that a traditional publishing house will only take on very few composers because the other part of it is unlike the pop world where you typically have the flavor of the month, sometimes even the week, the arc for le earning a return on concert music or new music uh, can be many years and sometimes decades. So you're basically making an investment in a composer over the long haul. And if you're a composer who has signed on for that, most of the time, it's a pretty good deal if you're, you know, one of the A-list composers. But there are reasons why some composers don't want to give up their copyrights, and, and other composers, as I mentioned, they don't even have the opportunity to get that kind of a deal. So where does everybody else go? And until very recently, there really wasn't a lot of options, because a composer like yourself can put up your own website, and I would say most composers probably have their own websites these days, and they have their, their, their bio and their photos and, and uh, audio clips of their work, and maybe they'll put up the first couple of pages of a score, and they'll have you know, their, their works list and their performance calendar, but they don't have a means really for monetizing the work. You said so yourself in, in last week's uh, show that if somebody emails you, you're inclined to just email them the, the PDF of the score. And, you know, that's fine if you're willing to, to do that, 
but a lot of composers like yourself don't really have the option to do otherwise because you don't have a uh, sales and licensing apparatus attached to your website and you don't necessarily have the expertise to be able to do the business terms for a license appropriately and appropriately price uh, the works. And the fulfillment department here in my apartment has taken the entire month of August off. I don't know what they're <laughs> thinking. I mean, it, it, so that, that is a lot of work. And even if it's not a ton of stuff, like getting stuff out the door, e- even in even in a very basic situation, like me, you know, printing, like going to Kinko's or something and printing off a nice looking yeah, performance me, material it, set. It's, it, it is a lot of work. And let me address that and, and also address something that came up in, in last week's show. One of the things about Score Street is the files are protected. And we're using Scorch, which we know has problems, especially for Mac users. And as of last week, um, Avid has issued uh, a new plugin, which you know we're testing to see if it actually works. But the benefit of having the files protected is when you upload your files, the score and parts to Score Street, you're uploading PDFs. And we work with Hal Leonard, who then we send the file, the PDF files over with metadata to them. They scorch the files, send the files, scorched files back to us with metadata. They show up on the Score Street site so that anybody can look at a full score for free. So you never have to send out perusals ever again. That's one thing. That's and, with, and with Scorch, the way it works, it's not watermarked or anything, but if you purchase one download, it only lets you print it once. And unless you purchase, you can't print unless you're willing to take, you know, screenshot after screenshot after screenshot. And, you know, as your colleagues in last week's panel mentioned, there are always ways for somebody who really wants to be uh, a bad actor to get around stuff, but you try to create incentives for people to do the right thing. And by cre- and Boozy and Shermer, Shermer started it, but and then Boozy followed suit. They're putting more and more of their scores online, full scores, file protected, so that they don't have to send out perusals. And with with this mechanism, again, a composer like yourself, you'll never have to once you upload your files. You'll never have to worry about sending out perusals again. You'll never have to worry about boxing up and photocopying and going to Kinko's, who invariably screws it up. And, of course, <laughs> they're not going to print it on 9 by 12 paper, and they're not going to bind it properly. The thing is, with Score Street, we have your PDFs once you upload them. And if somebody goes to the site and says, we want to do a print-on-demand, that, that order and the PDFs in a, in, a, in a zip file go to Subido, and they fulfill that order print-on-demand. And Subido does print-on-demand for Boozy, for Shermer, for EAM, and for other publishers. So you're getting top-quality service that you don't have to worry about, and then Subido ships it out, and, and, uh, and the customer pays the freight, not you. So it's, there's a lot of convenience involved. Uh, with Score Street, once you take the time to put up your profile and upload the score and parts for your works. And how much control do the composers uh, at Score Street have over the 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 level of that that DRM that you're that you're uh, putting on the on the scores? I really like the idea of digital perusals. That. Is is a, is a fantastic new thing, and, and I'm really glad. I've been really glad to see over the last several years to see the the giant publishers getting on board with it. And it's great that um, Score Street is offering a platform for for uh, composers who who aren't you know John Adams to be able to do something like that. Um, I remember one of the real frustrations that I always had as a, as a DMA student was finding scores just to look at what's going on in, along with a recording mm-hmm. of, of a new piece of music. You can't find that kind of stuff anywhere unless you're willing to you know, spend thousands of dollars to rent a full set of performance materials or something. Yeah, I mean, that's um, one of and the so things So it's really we'll- great for, just for, from an educational standpoint that that's going to be available. 
Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about how much control composers have over that kind of thing. Well, the, 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 the metadata that goes over is, you know, is fairly limited enough to identify the pieces, the, the name of the piece, the composer, the, the number of pages in the PDF, that sort of thing. But if you've been on the site, which I, which I know you have, um, every piece of information that's visible on the site is entered by the composer. So the composer has 100% control. The only thing that the composer doesn't control is the format. We create the template, but all of the information, however much or little information, right, so we're looking at Franco Terry. So all that information about recent uh, commissions, compositions, if you click, uh, if you scroll down to the description of Brinson's race, all that was entered by Franco Terry. So that's 100% control. All that's entered by Franco Terry. So every, co so, you know, some composers have more descriptions than others. If you go, um, Dave, to the search works page, because, uh, or actually go back to the home page, because um, Frank really, and that's also a composer's choice. Frank chose not to enter, you know, a full biography. He has just limited information about himself on the Score Street site, although he goes the other extreme and enters a lot of information about the individual pieces. Um, if you click on, say, uh, Joel Friedman's, uh, uh, bi you know, picture, you'll see a more full uh, bio there. And, and what we've done with Score Street is one of the things that I didn't like about other publishers' sites, and I'm not singling anyone out, but you can go to Boozy Shermer Presser and all of them, you click on a composer and you see reams of verbiage and you don't really get a sense of the composer's music unless you already know the composer's music. So we're, what we're doing is Score Street is really geared for commerce. And it's geared to have people search and find music as quickly as possible and then decide by perusing it. And if you either click on the title or you click on the green arrow, that takes you to the actual work page where you then can then click on either... Uh, if you see the Score Street icon, and I know you don't like the logo, but the old one actually was even more disliked by composers. This is the new logo that more composers like than, than the old one. Uh, so you can click on that, and hopefully you can peruse the full score. We ha do have some technical difficulties with certain browsers, but you should get. A, but you have to allow pop-ups, and if you're in a browser that works, you should be able to... Uh, view the full score. But, oh, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't have Scorch installed on this computer. Right, you'd have to install yeah. uh, install Scorch. And again, you know, you have an audio clip. So it's, and all that information is put up by the composers. But we try to make it as easy as possible. If you were to sign up, and we do offer a thirty day free trial. So you know, here's another plug. You, Dave, you would sign up, and all of the stuff is, you know. Menu-driven check boxes, fill in the blanks. We try to make it as easy as possible so that you're just filling out an online questionnaire, and then boom, your web, your full-blown website. And if you go back to what we had with Joel, you have everything that a composer's website would have, including a bio, a works list, a discography, a performance calendar, reviews. Um, you know, on the home page, you have a person that you can have a personal statement about your compositional aesthetic. Again, it's all 100% controlled by the composer. That's really interesting, and it's it's cool to see that you're you're giving um, you know that much that much agency. I love, I love that there's this is a place for for the reviews that you just mentioned. This is this is very cool. Right, go to the home page. But you'll see in the composer's words, Joel put a fairly short statement. That statement can be much longer. And the home is basically another quick snapshot. So you have, you know, like a very brief critical review on your home page. And like the first news item uh, on the home page, all the other news items and all the other reviews would show up on those pages. So you see he has more reviews. You got performances. So it's it's everything that a, a composer site uh, would have you have with Score Street, plus the ability to actually transact commerce, which most composers uh, with 
a relatively few exceptions, aren't really able to do. Either they don't have the expertise or they don't have the time or a combination of both. So, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to provide a service. And again, going back to my conversation that only a few composers get to be signed up uh, with the major publishing houses, we're providing, you know, basically the, 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 the boozies and shermers and pressers, they're supposed to be the black car limousine. You know, you get personal service, you have a staff of people inputting all this stuff. Here, in exchange for complete control, for controlling your copyrights, for getting 100% of the royalties, you'd still have to do a certain amount of the work because you are still the publisher. We're actually acting as an agent publisher in, in, the, in the parlance of the industry. But we're providing the baseline services that you can't get elsewhere. As you know, Dave, there are plenty of other sites and there are a few good ones out there where you can go and put up your music uh, and, and sell sheet music downloads. But there's no other site that I know of besides Score Street where you can not only sell sheet music downloads, but do print on demand, have full score perusals available, and have rentals, sync licensing, permissions, grand rights, arrangements, all of that, everything that a full service publisher handles score street handles see now and that to me is i think the thing that's really interesting is because like you said there are plenty of places on the internet even not just for music i i, I for for a while i was looking at some some other places um and and thinking about how they might apply to music that sell just generic digital goods like you you have you make a thing that is in a digital format you upload the thing to our to our stuff, and then we will sell digital copies of it to whomever. And that could be for recordings, it could be for ebooks, it could be for digital copies of scores, right. it could be for software, it could be for anything. Um, but one thing that's really interesting, because Score Street is uh, so much more specific, is that you guys offer a lot of these very music publishing specific services, like uh, handling things like sync rights. Um, uh, and, and grand rights and those kinds of licensing things that composers uh, I, I certainly didn't get any of in school um, but is, is a really big part of the publishing industry. Absolutely. That, uh, that's right. And, you know, I've gone and done lectures to the Juilliard Composers Forum and NYU Composers Forum and it amazes me that, you know, composers can go through their bachelor's, master's, and, and doctorate and still know pretty much nothing about the business of how their music is sold and marketed. And to me, that's just, uh, it's, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, I was at the NYU Composers Forum, and half of the composers there are film composers or, or budding film composers, and half of them are, you know, traditional new music concert composers. So since half of them are film composers, one of the first questions I asked is, who knows what a work for hire is? <laughs> there were 25 people in the room. Only one person raised his hand. Wow. Now, half of these people are film composers, and they don't know what a work for hire is. Or a certificate of authorship. Yeah, this is, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's troubling to me. And one of the reasons for Score Street is, okay, I can't go and, and teach all of the composers all of this stuff, although, like I said, I have an article out there that, that, that's available. But I can provide a service for the composers. So, you know, as you work with Score Street, you will, you know, kind of learn by doing. If somebody, uh, get, you know, takes a sync license of your works, you'll see that in your royalties, and you'll go and you can look at uh, a Score Street sync license and see what the pricing was for that particular license. And, you know, in that regard, you'll at least learn something about the business as you're a part of it. Well, and that's an interesting part, I think, of this of your business model at Score Street is that you are charging for specific services that you are doing, rather than, as you mentioned earlier, the traditional you know fifty fifty split or something along those lines that a lot of other stores get. Um, you are you're charging instead uh, a monthly fee just for the services. Is that is that that's right? I'm understanding that, that correctly. That's right. So everything that I've described, you know, from 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 handling downloads to print on demand to all the licensing, 
all of that is included in the monthly fee. The only things that aren't included in the monthly fee are things that we can't automate or things that we can't do on a volume business, such as negotiating a commissioning agreement. First of all, the composer has to be willing to want to write the piece. We can't just automate somebody coming up and saying, we want to commission composer X to write a piece. And what if the composer doesn't want to write that piece for that commissioner? So anything that we have to personally get involved, such as that, such as performing editorial work on a score, that we do charge extra and, you know, fees, fees vary for that. But the basic publishing services, all of that is included in the monthly fee. And I know that some people have commented that um, the rack rate of 30 bucks a month seems a little steep. But if you put it in perspective of, first of all, you know, I, I've gone to your bio, and I know, uh, you know, where, where you've studied and for how long. And if you think about composers, the time and effort and the, the dollars to get a bachelor's, a master's, and then a doctorate, and then you think about all the equipment that you've purchased uh, to write music and, and, and run Finale or Sibelius or what have you, you know, this is, this is another investment in yourself. And, you know, if you do one rental of one you know, work that's 10 minutes or less for a, you know, regional orchestra, one performance. And as you know, typically if you have a rental, you'll get two or three performances because they're going to rehearse it. So they'll play the work two or three times. But even if they perform it only once, that's going to more than pay for a, a year's worth of the service. If you do a handful of downloads a month or maybe two or three print-on-demand works where even with deducting the print cost, you're still getting north of 70% of that sale, whereas Boozy and Shermer and the traditional publishers, you get 12.5% of a printed work. So, you know, it's very easy if you are a, an active composer and actively building your network and everything and directing people to the site it's very easy for the have the site more than pay for itself. And of course, since it is an expense, you know, the net price is even less at the end of the year when you do your taxes and, and write it off as, as a business expense. Not that I'm giving tax advice, but <laughs> talk to your tax advisor and they'll tell you that that's the case. So, well, so speaking of that cost, I, how much control do composers have over the price of, oh, of yes, the digital that, goods? It, that did come up. We set the pricing. Okay, and it's based on, you know, rentals, it's based, and if you go to uh, the site where it says FAQs for customers, we explain how we set prices for various things such as print-on-demand and downloads and rentals and, and things like that. And, for example, with print, whether it's download or print-on-demand, it's a function of the number of pages. Again, we've automated things, so you know if if the score is forty five pages, it's going to be less than the score for that's you know twenty pages. And we set those prices because, for the most part, we found that composers tend not to really be able to set prices for themselves, certainly with licensing. And composers typically undersell their works because they don't want to lose the sale. They don't want to lose the gig. So, what about the, what, so you said that composers don't have a sense of uh, how much their music is worth in terms of licensing, which I think is absolutely true. Um, for the same reasons that none of the composers that you knew about knew about you were talking to knew about works for hire. Right, um, exactly. It's just You're outside just... of what we learn in class. And but but let me. School. But I know where you go. Let me let me let me talk about the print. We do have the option. If a composer really wants to set his or her prices, they can send us an email and we can send them a composer code where we adjust the prices up or down. And right now the way that works is it's across the board. So if we adjust the print prices up, that means the rental prices, the sync prices, and all those go up. What we're going to do, and I think, uh, and I have to talk to my uh, technical partner, it's, it's fairly easy. I have a feeling that most of the adjustments that we're going to get from composers or requests for adjustments 
are going to be on the downloads and the print on demand, and they're going to say, look, just like you said, Dave, you know, we don't know the licensing. That's, that's your expertise. We're happy to let you set those prices. So what we'll probably do is have a couple of you know, internal composer codes where we just raise the print, downloads and print on demand up or down, and leave the rest of the stuff at our standard rates. But we do have the ability to do that. We can't do it on a work-by-work -work basis, but we can say, okay, if you think your works as a whole should be, say, 25% higher or lower, that we can do for you upon request. And, and obviously there is, you know, a, a, a minimum cost to you to produce the thing, the, the physical score for the print-on-demand stuff. Right. And that, and that does so there's get a deducted. floor for that. So, the, so there, there is a floor for that, and there, and there is actually something of a floor for the downloads because, um, uh, like I said, and it's no secret, it's on the site, uh, we have uh, a, a, an agreement with Hal Leonard where they scorch the files for us, and just for download sales, not print on demand, only download sales, they take 10% of the fee. Right. So, you know, for that service to protect your files, that's, you know, it's a pretty inexpensive cost. But, you know, we, we wouldn't want somebody selling a, uh, uh, you know, a, a 16 page Coral Octavo uh, for, you know, 15 cents. Now, one thing that um, I think you guys have done really well on the Score Street site that I think uh, is is a stumbling block for a lot of uh, companies that are starting in this space and working in similar projects is that you have, I think, done a, a really good job of making the outward facing site um, as much about uh, people looking for music as it is people looking to sell music. Um, well, and so you've, you've got some interesting discovery tools there for performers that are, or, or anyone else that's interested in, in buying performance materials. Well, yeah, that, that's right. And again, going back to our earlier discussion, everything that you see on the site is input by the composers. And one of the things that the composer does on the back end is not only are they putting in descriptions of the works, we also have them tag the works and put in key, key words. So, for example, going back to uh, your last week's uh, show with the, uh, with the bass clarinet duo, if somebody were looking for bass clarinet music, they could go to the Search Works page and either put in uh, under, you know, instrumentation, go scroll through and put in bass clarinet, or just type in bass clarinet as a keyword, and without knowing the names of the composers, any works for bass clarinet would show up. So, you know, it makes it much easier to find works. And, you know, one of the things that you discussed at the start of our conversation is this, is, this sort of site with this search capability is very good for a composer like yourself, Look, just looking for new music, looking to see what other composers are doing, looking to see, uh, you know, what's out there. Because, you know... Franco Terry is one of my good friends, and I know one of the, he's a composer himself, and he goes and, and he buys a lot of music by other composers, and, and most other composers, I think, do the same thing. They're, they're always uh, looking to peruse works and, and purchase works and study works by, by other composers to, to learn new techniques and to see what their peers are doing. Well, I think that's really not just among composers, but between composers and performers. One of the things that uh, it, we really lack are a lot of tools to connect us um, professionally around the things that we are actually making in our, you know, artistic lives to connect not just composers and composers around those things, but mm -hmm. also composers and performers around those things. I, I often felt even in school where it was a relatively insular community of, you know, a few dozen composers and a few hundred uh, performers that I was writing all this music and there were probably, you know, flute players that would be interested in playing some new music by a a composer they just didn't know of any and I would have been interested for writing for you know 
un- unaccompanied bass trombone. If only I had known that there was a person looking for that. In, that in, and that's in the one of the. That is exactly one of the things that Score Street is trying to address. The fact that we have uh, a drop down, you know, somebody who wants to commission a work. Uh, can, you know, find a composer that they're interested in. Part of the questionnaire that we have that a composer fills out, and again, you don't have to answer any of the questions. If you leave a question out, it doesn't show up as a blank on the site. We're not out to embarrass any composers. But one of the questions is, what works, work or works would you like to be commissioned to write? So somebody wow. who's look, So somebody's looking for composers, uh, and let's say you were really looking to write a flute concerto, and you were on the site, and they browsed composers and came across you, and they said, oh, this composer's actually looking to write the very piece that I'm looking to commission. What do you know? Um, And in terms of educators and performers being able to find stuff, again, uh, you know, if you're, let's say you had written that flute piece, and you were on the Score Street site, they don't have to know Dave McDonald. They don't have to go do a a Google search or anything like that. They just go onto the Score Street site, type flute, and a list of works uh, for flute. It could be a flute concerto. It could be a piece for solo flute. It could be a piece for flute and piano. Then they can go narrow down their search if they get too many works, just like with a Google search. But they'll find all the works for flute without having to know any particular composer. And then... They can preview the full score, and if there's an audio clip, they can listen to it, and then they can download it if they want to buy a download and, or do all the things that uh, you, you can do with a piece of music. Well, th- th- listen, that's this really great, and, and, I, and I, I applaud you for, for, for striking out and trying this, this, this great project. Um, just really quick before we wrap it up, I know it's sure. still really early days for Score Street. What has the reaction been uh, from from both sides of of that that we've we're just talking about the the composer side and the the customer side? Well, look, you know, the people who are actually signed up on the site, uh, it, it's been very favorable. Uh, as I mentioned, we still have some technical difficulties that we're working out uh, with any. Uh, essentially software application, because that's really what this is. It's got a lot of moving parts, as you know, because people are uploading their data on the front end, and then people, if they go into license, they're filling out a questionnaire, and that all has to interact, and you have to check out. So there have been some glitches that we have to address, but, you know, people have been, uh, people have been pretty satisfied. I mean, we've had in the blogosphere a, a few naysayers, but those people didn't actually go on the site. They just, you know, heard about this and they decided that they didn't like it for whatever reason. Um, And look, you're always going to have that. People are going to think what they will. But like you said, it is early days. Uh, We don't have as many people out there on the site right now as we would like. We also recognize that it's the dead of August and uh, people are away. And a lot of our target market are people who are either teaching uh, composition or are studying composition at the master's and doctorate level and are otherwise affiliated with educational institutions. So, you know, we're hoping that this, you know, kind of uh, stealth time, if you will, where we don't have that many people on the site yet, but the people that we have, we're able to identify things that we need to fix. So hopefully after Labor Day, when everybody comes back from their uh, summer hiatus, then we'll see a much larger influx of uh, composers on the site and presenters and performers looking for music uh, on the site. Well, congratulations on all the, the work that you've put into it so far. Well, thank you very um, I, much. I, I really am excited to see where it goes from here. So thank you so much for, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been a pleasure. So thanks for checking that out with us. That's an interview I did with Mark Ostro just a few days ago. Um, and I, I want to make one thing clear about, about this. We've done several uh, interviews this week with people that have products. And I, I just want to be very clear that we don't get 
paid to interview these people. Uh, these are just we're not necessarily even recommending these these products. These are just things that we think are interesting that we think that our audience would be interested in hearing about. Um, so uh, if if that sounds like something that interests you, definitely check it out and and let us know what your experience is. We'd be very curious if anybody in our audience is trying any of these, whether it's it's Note Flight or this new Steinberg product that doesn't exist yet, or this score street that we talked to Mark Osher about. If you're using it, let us know how it went. We're, 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 we're figuring this stuff out just the same as you all. This, this product, score street, has been ar- around for about a month now, publicly available. So let us know what you think. Do you guys have any thoughts? I know you, you weren't there to, to ask Mark uh, anything, but do you have any thoughts on the interview? Oh, you know what? I can't hear you because I I potted you down for the pre-record. <laughs> um, we've talked about this personally before, but I, I've barely I barely have any of my sheet music available at all to anybody, and so this would be. I'm just interested in this as a platform to check out to maybe start doing something like that. And the 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 kind the kind of interaction that they have and ability to set up a bio and have it be a a little bit more of an interactive thing than just a place to deposit your scores and having uh, is, is cool. And then obviously the ratio of what they make to what you would make if you uh, saw a lot of scores is pretty cool. And the monthly rate, your annual rate kind of thing is, it sounds generally quite interesting. So I'm going to do some more research on it. Maybe try it out myself. Yeah. What do you think, Sam? You get a month free. You get a month free. It's actually inspiring to get your crap together, you know? <laughs> like, oh, I yeah, need exactly. to clean up all my scores and, uh, you know, give it a try. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of thing where the more people who buy into the idea, idea, both as people looking for music and composers who are looking to use their services, the better. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah this that's kind some... of thing, Go ahead. it just depends on what kind of buy-in from both of those groups you get. Yeah, that's something I was thinking about uh, after I did that interview is that there's a little bit of this kind of network effect that we talk about with social networks on the web is that the value of the network is tied to the number of people that are there and how active those people are. And so if Score Street becomes a place that people know to go to to get interesting sheet music, then it's going to blow up. But to get to that point, there has to be a bunch of people that take this leap at this early stage and that's the same thing that happens with with social networks right you know facebook yeah. wasn't useful until all of your friends were on facebook and now you know google plus has a hard time is is a hard sell because most of your friends aren't on it you know right. so that's and that's that's the thing if score street becomes a place where composers know that people are going to see their music and buy it and a place where performers know that they can go find what they're looking for and support composers, then it will thrive. But both of those are like mutually informing, right? They can't happen yeah. independent of one another. So it'll be, so it'll be I, interesting to watch. I think mm-hmm. the takeaway from that is if the, the fact that you get a month free to me is, is a great thing. And the takeaway for me is if I'm I'm really considering doing it since you get a free month. And in the and the takeaway is if you're going to do it and you're going to do the free month during that free month, you need to pound the pavement and really push the service out there to people and let make sure they know about it. Because the more people that know and check it out, the better it is for you. You know, Definitely. if you're trying it for a month free, you might as well try as hard as you can to make it work. Well, we'll certainly be following this, and we'll let you know what our experiences are. Uh, you mm-hmm. can follow us on Twitter. You should follow the guys on Twitter. They're going to if Sam, Sam and Nader say they're going to try it. You should follow them on Twitter. I'm sure they will tell you all about what their experiences are like. Sam is at House Goy. Nate is at a Nate Tree. Um, so check them out, and uh, we'll we'll keep you posted on how the how it goes. Uh, our news this week. This was a really weird week of news. Because there was that's the domain gate theme music. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we had a gate. Well, okay. I don't know if this rises to the level of gateness that some other gates have risen to. Uh, but you know, I'm not sure that anything in the world of orchestras is is gate worthy in in comparison to something like Watergate uh, or Viola Gate or yeah. Viola Gate. Sure. I don't even remember what Viola Gate is, but. <laughs> anyway oh it was a big deal 
Domain, I assume, since it has viola and gate, that it was a huge deal. Right. Uh, we've been talking on and off about the Minnesota Orchestra. The Minnesota Orchestra has been locked out since October of 2012. They missed their entire season. Um, they, during that missed season, were nominated for a Grammy for their recording of Sibelius uh, 2 and 5. Uh, and they, I don't, they, they did not win the Grammy, but they, it was, I think it might have been their first nomination. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it was very, very big deal. And uh, they're still locked out. It's been, we're approaching a year. Uh, they've lost a number of their great principal players. They have uh, a music director, Osmo Vanska, who is threatening to leave. He has set a date in September. I think it's September 9th, if I recall correctly. Uh, if they do not have a deal by September 9th, he's out because he wants to go somewhere that's going to actually let him, you know, conduct orchestra. Good job. Uh, <laughs> and. It's been a very contentious thing. Both sides have, have been uh, arguing back and forth in the press. It's been very, very, very bitter. Um, some some of us have wondered aloud if they have passed the point of no return and we should just start you know, picking up the pieces now for the next iteration of, of an orchestra in, in their hall. Um, and this week, uh, enterprising blogger Emily Hogstad of Song of the Lark uh, published a piece in which she uh, explained how this symphony supporter, this musician support website called Save Our or Save Our Symphony MN org got its name of Save Our Symphony MN org. Uh, Save Our Symphony is an organization that was founded actually when the Detroit Symphony was on strike back two years ago when we first started the show. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra was on strike, and Save Our Symphony was an organization that was started by supporters of musicians in Detroit. And since then, this has become a key part of uh, a lot of these labor disputes is the, the, the fans of the orchestra, the audience, the, the, the donors even of these orchestra organizations who want to support the musicians themselves will start their own organizations, write press releases, start a website, do all this kind of advocacy uh, in public for the musicians. And it turns out that when they wanted to register something like SaveMinnesotaOrchestra.com or SaveOurMinnesotaOrchestra.com, which seems like a very specific thing, is not available. And so what, what they found out was things like Save the MN Orchestra, Save Our Orchestra, SaveOurOrchestra.net, SaveOurOrchestra.org, SaveOurMinnesotaOrchestra.net, SaveOurMinnesotaOrchestra, all these things, about 12 or 13 domains were all unavailable. And if you're not familiar with how domains get registered, unless you specifically ask for it, the information of the personal entity that is registering the domain is public through what's called a who is lookup. And so this, uh, Emily Hogstad did a who is lookup in these domains that were purchased. You know who bought them? The <laughs> Minnesota Orchestra Association. The management of the orchestra wanted to make it harder for support musicians to publicize their support to have a snappy domain name to connect with people and connect with the press and connect with all these other people on the web they are what's called domain squatting they're preventing the orchestra from getting any of these other domains and this is something that's not free it costs 10 or 15 bucks to register a domain and they registered 12 or 13 of them uh at godaddy of all places and uh it, it it blows my mind that they would spend this much time and energy doing this. And it's so incredibly petty. It's so petty. Yeah. Because there's always another... You can't get every possible domain, right? That's why so many of these new services have stupid names. Like there's a new alternative ticketing service called Tickly, T-I-K-L-Y dot com, right? Yeah. Why they call well, it Tickly? It is, because it was available. The more directly related to whatever the actual thing you're trying to advocate for is the URL title, the more memorable it is, the better it is from a networking point of view. You know, so uh, the, to me, this actually speaks to another problem we've talked about with orchestras. They don't hire really qualified uh, new media specialists because if they were going to do this, they should have done it all the way. Like anybody worth their salt who was trying to do this for them who were and they were getting paid – should have also come up with Save Our Symphony in uh, MN.org because they, they like 
hit everything around that, you know? I think there's too many of them. There's no way they could get all of them. But we didn't get to the, the key thing here. The key thing is you can also see in the Whois lookup when yeah. the domain was registered. And as right. I mentioned earlier, the orchestra has been locked out since October of last year. Mm -hmm. But these domains were registered in May. They were registered in May 24th and 25th. So not only are they being petty and preventing these people from getting a domain name, which is more easily memorable or easier to guess or whatever, they also did this long before the lockout happened. And uh, our, our friend Drew McManus over at Adaptistration wrote a, a, a great post about this. And he wrote, uh, this is a quote, It is a clear indication that the employer, the Minnesota Orchestra Association, had little to no intention of negotiating in good faith. So they were expecting things to go so badly that there would be a lockout, a work stoppage. And these were registered not just for one year which you can do, they were registered for two years. And here's the other boneheaded, they didn't hire the right person for the job thing, is that you can make the oh, owner yeah. of, a, of, a, of a domain private, which anyone who knows what the hell they're doing would have known to do that, because if they had done that, people would certainly have suspicions that something was going on, because you could still see when they were all registered and the fact that they're not being actually used for anything, but they didn't do that. So when uh, she, when she looked it up, she was able to see who registered the blog. I mean the, uh, the URL. Right. So if you're going to, if you're going to be dirty and underhanded, at least be dirty and underhanded in the smartest way possible. Exactly. And, and these people are clearly not good with the internet. Um, yeah. It's, it's really, it's really frustrating. It's really stunning that they would, do this may and maybe they wanted people to find out maybe they wanted to say you know what screw you all um <laughs> this is how we feel about you right? right this is this is we we love you so much that we're going to squat on all of the most likely domains that you would want to have and this is something that they're not it's not even the the, the thing that's crazy about this is these websites aren't run by the musicians they're yeah. squatting on these these domain names not to prevent they're direct adversaries, the musicians, from getting these, which is crazy that we can say that their adversaries are the people that play the music. Like this should yeah. not. This should be a collaborative relationship, not an adversarial relationship. But they're these squatting on these domains is preventing the supporters of their organization from expressing themselves the way they want. It's it's well, it's really stunning and and uh, you know what the the when I first read about this the thing that I thought was I should register something like the Minnesota Orchestra Association are assholes dot com and redirect <laughs> it to like some web page that was either either the musician's <laughs> web page or the MOA web page or something right which is something people do there's a funny uh, weird like uh, uh, conspiracy theory political podcast i don't listen to it but i i know some of the of some of the people that are on it and apparently this is like a thing that their audience does it's like they will register like the hillary clinton for president.com or something like that and redirect it to this podcast's homepage <laughs> um like things that they think people would guess and so right. like something like that like the moa or jerks.com and linking it to them i think would be hilarious but i'm not going to spend 15 dollars just to do something petty like that unlike the minnesota orchestra association <laughs> right and what one thing that has has been you know a tough spot for uh administration in these orchestras they've had issues is when the public gets behind the musicians right and that's clearly what they're trying to avoid so they're trying to disenfranchise the people that the orchestra as a whole musicians and administration are supposed to be serving it's stunning it's stunning it's yeah. stunning and and, um, and on top of all of this another thing we found out recently is uh bis the record label that the minnesota orchestra records with that recorded their uh grammy nominated uh sibelius album last year they were nominated for best orchestral performance while they were locked out. While they were locked out. And they, they played like a special like, hey, we were nominated for a Grammy concert. It was like they called everything off for a night and did this thing. And then they were back to hating each other. 
Um, so Biss has had to now cancel the planned recording session of Sibelius' th- third and sixth symphonies that they were going to make uh, this season. If they get back together, there's the possibility that they could, you know, uh, schedule something later in the season. But they have already, you know, bailed on this this recording uh, that was going to be another excellent recording. You know, this is I think this is a, an ongoing project uh, of Vanska and Minnesota to record the complete um, uh, Sibelius symphonies. So that's kind of a bummer because those are those are great pieces. And the the I I, I heard I didn't hear the the second symphony from this recording, but I heard the fifth symphony from this recording, and it's fantastic. It's, it's really really solid stuff. So it's kind of a bummer that this is preventing us from not not just the people in Minnesota from hearing this this great orchestra, but from everybody else from having more of these great recordings. And these people are being stupid and petty about it. So let's move on to something that is. Uh, you know, much much less depressing. And it's copyright. <laughs> well, it's just this is kind of whipping voice. So Sam, I'll, I'll let you. What's what's the story uh, well, with the copyright? You know, we're talking about the Sibelius symphonies. You know what? If if the law, if copyright protection for authors does not get extended another twenty years, coming up soon, what we might get to see really soon is the Steamboat Willie symphony. Explain, um, explain <laughs> yourself, Sam Messiers. Currently, uh, Congress is reviewing America's copyright law again. Um, the last time this happened in 1998, they put another 20-year extension on to uh, the life of the author plus – it was plus 50 years, and now it's plus 70 years. And people are speculating that during the, the uh, review process that Congress is engaged in right now, we'll end up having another 20-year extension. <clears throat> this is a – the piece I'm looking at is from Giga Ohm, uh, Giga Ohm. Um, but there's a, there's some important factors that are pointed out in this in this article. That the, the the main one is just the whole climate of what people think about copyright has shifted, and there are several reasons. One is just the public is more aware of how copyright works, what its important is, importance is, and, and what it actually does compared to what the people who are on either extreme of the argument, let's say, um, sort of scream about it. On one side, you'd have like Disney, who would be happy if copyright were permanent for all time. And then on the other end, you have people who think everything should be free, and if you can get it on the internet, it's all fair play. Um, uh, and there, the there is, is nothing in between. Yeah, well, there there is and there should be, and that's what – and just, just in anything like this, the moderate voices are the ones that are the hardest to be that, – that have the hardest time making themselves heard. Um, but the points – the issues that are pointed out specifically in this article is that tech companies like Google, who are very much uh, in favor of expanding public domain and sort of free knowledge um, platforms, have much more lobbying clout than in the past with Congress – um, there's new studies that, that support the idea that rather than protecting anyone, uh, there's an Atlantic piece that's referenced, and but I think we've all heard pieces like this. Instead of protecting anyone, what the copyright structure that we have now just means that books that uh, become unavailable. Um, right. You have orphaned because, works. Yeah, they're orphaned works. Um, people are becoming much more uh, aware of and big fans of, as I am, of things like the Internet Archive and the new – the Digital Public Library of America is something – I mean, I knew it was there, but I just started using it quite a bit, and it is an amazing, amazing platform. Um, there was an NPR piece on it recently about how uh, spe- they cite specific pieces of research that couldn't have happened without the, the Digital Public Library of America. So this is um, a story to watch over the next few years. This is there's not actually, despite the fact that we're calling this our news segment, there's not actually, mm-hmm. let's say, news. Right. Well, I think it's news as in the discussions are going on. So write your congressman, you know, right. tell your friends. Public awareness is a big part of this. Uh, and mm-hmm. and speaking of that, the last point it makes, and I think this is a big one, um, is the political climate regarding the conservative parties or conservatives in politics. Um, 
have been more become more skeptical about the uh, value of uh, expanding uh, uh, copyright because to them it always related directly to pro- property rights, which as we know is something that most Republicans will shout from the mountaintops about. However, there's a practical reason in that you know studies have shown that that's not actually is what what's occurring and that how uh, copyright stifles creativity but also just for raw political when reasons. was the last time a scientific study swayed the opinion of a politician who had made up his or right. her mind well the the more practical thing is that the the republicans don't want to get shut out of the white house again and they want to maintain the control that they have um yeah i believe and, it when i see it <laughs> so but that might be a way for them to get some younger votes um, but we'll see. But the, the reason I brought up Steamboat Willie is because uh, I think is it next year? Um, well, sometime soon. No, it's not that soon. Well, if if copyright is not extended, um, things like Steamboat Willie and early Disney works will be coming into um, public domain soon. And uh, it's an interesting thing. I've never seen this considering what a an advocate for this kind of thing I am, I didn't know. Uh, there's a list every year of what the stuff that actually entered the public domain, mm-hmm. and it's put out by the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, the public domain review, where we're going to have a link to the things that came out this year. Well, Duke, it's, it's really Duke has a really out. interesting thing. The Duke Law School does a similar interesting thing where they put out the things that would have been public domain if right. copyright had not been extended in 1976 and again in 1998. Lady in the Tramp? Yeah. Uh, hmm. The Seven Year Itch? Rebel Without a Cause? So um, Steamboat Tootie Willie was, was 1928, so by the current standard, I think it would become public domain in 95 years after that, so like 2023. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. So, eh. Get 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 your waiting pants on. Yeah. Is oh, it... Re- Return of the King, the third installment of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, would if the 1978 law hadn't been passed, it would have entered public domain this year. Wow. Interesting. Wow. wow. Well. <sighs> oh, and also the, it mentions it... <laughs> one thing that I that I didn't know. Uh, back in was it in January? There was a ruling. The Supreme Court said that. Um, Peter and the Wolf can be removed from public domain. It has to do with folding some uh, rulings about public domain into a previous law. This was a big. We talked about this uh, when when it was happening. It was it involved uh, a conductor in Colorado who was. It, it was specifically about Prokofiev and uh, Shostakovich. May have been involved as well. It was, it was some weird thing about uh, Soviet copyright law or something like that. But there were works that were in the public domain, and then something changed, and they went on back under copyright. And so uh, there was some discussion as to whether or not works could, once they were in the public domain, go back under copyright. And take they lost that. Yeah, there are apparently take backs in this game. Mm-hmm. Let's move on. This is a really interesting study done by uh, a Harvard PhD uh, that that we just read about this week, uh, Chia Yung Se uh, apologized to her for uh, butchering her name, but uh, this is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this week, uh, or this month, I should say, and she was studying the effect of the visual aspect of music performance on people's perception of the quality of the performance. And she did this by uh, t- finding recordings of piano competitions, uh, of performances from piano competitions. And she sent to a number of different people, both experts and novices. Uh, some people got audio only. Some people got video only with no sound. And some people got regular audio video recordings. The people that got audio-only recordings, and and they were all asked to watch these recordings and pick which of the performances they thought won. Uh, It turns out that the people who got the audio-only recordings did less well at picking the winner compared than than the people who got the video-only recordings with no sound. So the people with video who could only see... 
picked the winner more uh, more frequently, more accurately, more reliably than the people who actually heard the performance, which is ostensibly what we're talking about when we're talking about music. Does what this surprise I, you, Nate? What I hear from that is more that there's a correlation between the video and audio performance and the video only than the video and audio to the audio only. Is that is that what they mean? That so they're comparing, as I read it, the video only to the audio only is yeah. the strongest difference. You, more people guessed correctly by watching the audio, video only compared to people who, considering this is a music performance contest, the people who actually had to got to listen to it but not see it were less likely to guess the winner, which is amazing. But you know, after I read this, I wasn't incredibly surprised. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people are very visual, generally, even musicians and non musicians. But and the, they kind of hint at this idea, and we should say just to make sure you understand, she has some serious cred. Um, yeah, she, she entered has, in these competitions in addition to being a PhD in whatever kind of cognitive science she's studying. <laughs> she has a PhD in organizational behavior and a secondary PhD in music. Brilliant. From, from Harvard. So yeah. anyway, um, well, you can. I think you can make the assumption that someone who is sort of the master of their domain when they're playing the Chopin piano concerto or whatever, you know, it translates to their body language compared to someone who... Um, doesn't feel like they're a hundred percent, and is but hoping is it, they don't mess up rather than you know. Isn't everyone in one of these high-level competitions pretty confident and like pretty good? Like that's the interesting thing is that one would think that the the differences in the sounds are very subtle at a high level, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, this is why we have experts as judges and not like random strangers on the street. Come in, hey, right. we'll give you a sandwich and 20 bucks if you pick a winner for the Van Cliburn competition or something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we don't do that. We find experts. But this says that even with those experts, the, the visual side is more telling about the performance in, yep. in a world where I think – the differences between the audio is very subtle, and even the video is very subtle. And and I would, I would I, it should be known, and I think anybody who's ever watched the show knows I, I'm not a fan of the whole concept of music contests. But at this high level, if you think if you're listening to the audio only, it's so subjective and like not it's not good bad. It's like opinion based. You know, the judge thinks that the cadenza should work this way because that's the way they were taught. Therefore, they're going to judge higher when they hear it the way they think it should go compared to someone who does it differently. Mm -hmm. um, but when you couple that with, you know, the way the person is handles themselves on stage, it's not surprising at all considering, like you said, Dave, considering what the performances will be, it's not surprising how much impact it can have. Yeah, you might see them, like, be able to see them like making these choices in their head and like going in a direction and mapping that with what you're hearing and maybe, yeah, seeing a little bit more of the person behind the music that you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mu Musician man one in the chat room says, so if I look fantastic while playing the piece, then I'll win. And I think that's exactly right. Yeah. We've, yeah. We, we've, talked about, fantastic, huh? we've talked <laughs> about uh, stuff like this before. We've talked about what people wear when they perform. Maybe that's going to make people think, more about that kind of thing you know you go to a uh an audition for an orchestra gig and what do you what do you wear when you they say it's a blind audition but I, I mean how many blind auditions have you gone to where you've shown up and then turns out it's not as blind as you thought right um i think the takeaway should be for performers and teachers is that it's an this, this the visual is an aspect of what's going on and while I'm not a fan of contests, for certain, like if you want to be a, a top echelon pianist and, and tour the world, you kind of are obligated to enter these contests and then either do very well or win. And uh, so that's something to consider if that's the road you're on. And speaking of really good piano performances, mm -hmm. sadly, the world lost Marion McPartland this year, I mean, uh, this week on Tuesday. She was 95 years old, so she did not uh, get ripped off as far as life expectancy goes. Sure. Um, if you don't know who uh, Marianne McPartland is, 
She's uh, English, uh, but came to the United States um, pretty young and had for 40 years hosted uh, Mary McPartland's Piano Jazz on NPR. And if you've never heard the show, I, I haven't looked, but I'm sure you can find it on YouTube or wherever. Um, it's a great show. It, great show. And she would have just giants of the jazz world piano players. And they would always do whoever she had on this. They would talk about their life and their influences. And then they would always have a solo performance by whoever the guest was. And then they would always do a duet, at least one. And it was never planned out, or at least it sounded a lot like it was never planned out. In the way you have, like, really, you know, bootstrapped jazz greats, they all know, you know, the canon. And uh, so they'll call out a standard, and they'll do it, and then they'll call out a standard, and they'll do it as a duet. And if you have any interest at all in, in jazz piano reharmonization, which is a very interesting um, sort of music theory endeavor, which I've done a little bit during my master's degree, um, you can hear some pretty amazing things when you have two people uh, who have some very sophisticated thoughts about reharmonization uh, working with each other to make a piece of music. It's really interesting. But but despite that, I think that one of the really interesting things about that show was how unpretentious it was. Yeah. Um, even though they they did address things like you're talking about that are kind of in the, the nitty-gritty end of the pool, um, were... It was very approachable, and in yeah. a lot of ways, I think it's it's the one of the models for the way we talk about music on this show. Right. So absolutely, uh, we certainly are going to to miss McPartland and her 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 great great uh, broadcasts. And like you said, Sam, we'll have to we should we should see if there's like an archive of those somewhere. I'll, I'll check it out, and, and if there is something I can find, I'll put it in the notes. Yeah. So that's going to do it for this week's show. Or do we have a we don't have a thing. Forget about it. That's going to do it for this week's show. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to everyone who was watching live. We had a great conversation going the whole time in the chat. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who got up and, and joined us this morning. We stream this show live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and you can join us then at soundnotion.tv slash live if that's something you'd like to participate in. And you can join us in chat. Uh, you did not have the opportunity this morning because our guest was pre-recorded, but... Oftentimes, you can ask questions of the of the guest who who's on the panel, and that's I think something that we all have a lot of fun with. Um, if you'd like to catch up with us after the show or share your comments after the show, you can always do that on our site. Find links to all the things we talked about. Soundnotion.tv/sn. You can also uh, you know subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're at Soundnotion. I'm at Dave McDowe. Sam is House Goy. Nate is a Nate Tree. A Nate tree. A Nate tree. A Nate tree. Uh, not the Nate tree. No, just, just, just one, one of the Nate trees. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> just a Nate tree. Um, and uh, you can, of course, subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes store or, or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. And if ours isn't there, then it's clearly not a place where fine podcasts are aggregated. Uh, you can support us using the Amazon affiliate links on our site. If you go to the right side, there's a little search box. When you go to Amazon, buy your regular Amazon stuff. It doesn't look any different to you. Uh, it doesn't cost you any more, but we get a tiny commission that helps us out a lot. So thanks to everyone who's been doing that. Uh, and we encourage you to do that uh, if you haven't done it. Sound Notion's introduction includes uh, music by what? I got something. Anyone, we announced last week on the show that um, Cadillac Moon Quartet was going to be on this week. If anybody was expecting that, we apologize. We're just rescheduling. Um, we're rescheduling. Uh, one of, Roberta had a so very, very sore throat, and I'm certain it was from screaming in excitement over getting to be on the show. <laughs> um, so while we, she recuperates, we're to reset schedule. So if you were looking for Cadillac Moon Ensemble, sorry that they will be back sometime to be announced shortly. All right. So that's going to do it for this week. Sound Ocean's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week.